the biggest problem with being born in the 1980s and coming up in the absolute greatest era of gaming, the 90s, and no, that is not up for debate, is that a lot of what you used to love about video games has changed so much the entire medium is almost unrecognizable at this point. I was lucky enough to live through a time when survival horror games were almost everywhere you looked. No matter what console you had, there was bound to be some kind of title chasing after that Resident Evil market share which, to someone like me who became obsessed with the genre, is akin to heaven on earth. And while we definitely haven't reached that same level again, I'm actually really surprised with the resurgence the survival horror genre has seen recently. However, I haven't always been this positive on the subject. A good while back, the popularity of first-person non-combat streamer bait sort of soured me on the whole indie horror scene and I was convinced that no company would pass up the massive paycheck that would come from farting one of these boring ass games out and having some Markiplier clone pretend to be scared by it. But after getting my hands on a few real deal, honest to goodness modern survival horror games, I can fully confirm that position is changed. Maybe devs nowadays do understand what it really takes to make a game in this genre, and there may be a slight chance I judged an entire sector of the industry based on a few bad apples. So today I'm looking to do a little redeeming because I'm starting to think there are a lot of cool titles I may have missed out on. Much like my Retro RE clone series, we'll be taking a look at a good handful of titles in this video and the criteria is very simple. The game has to in some significant way be chasing that familiar Resident Evil experience. And before you say it, because you absolutely will say it, I do know that technically RE is a clone of Alone in the Dark. I also play video games, but Capcom's Zombie Massacre Sim is the very first time the term survival horror was coined and let's be real here, it, not Alone in the Dark, cemented everything we know about the genre today. And that means if we're going to cover it here today, it must have at least most of these boxes checked. Tank controls, exploration-driven gameplay with an emphasis on backtracking, inventory management, a heavy horror atmosphere helped along by a strong feeling of isolation, adventure game-inspired puzzle solving requiring a mix of both mechanical manipulation and item hunting, and of course pre-rendered backdrops, fixed camera perspectives, and limited resources are always a plus. Now I know a lot of you are very eager to tell me exactly how wrong I am, and I very well could be. Believe me, it's not like it's an entirely rare occurrence around here, but for the time being, I'm the guy making the mediocre YouTube content, so as long as that's the case, those are the rules. And with that boring nonsense out of the way, I think it's high time we do what we all came here for and jump into some awesome modern Resident Evil clones. <sighs> Alright, if we're gonna have some kind of a list chronicling modern survival horror, it's only fitting it starts with a phrase I use most often when talking about video games, music, and my overall taste in fashion. Back in 1995 is an interesting little throwback that hit the scene around 2016 and was developed by a single dev headquartered here in my new home, Tokyo, and it is very clear this guy really enjoyed that early 90s aesthetic right from the start. Not only is this a modern-ish title that plays exclusively in 4x3, but it also includes that oh-so-familiar 90s 3D look. Character models are made up of very simple, low-detail polygons. The environment actually displays an effect close to the affine texture warping the PS1 was so well known for, and the enemies are unrecognizable as anything other than randomly assembled geometric shapes, aka exactly how I like them. And if I'm being honest, that might be the very first stumbling block right out of the gate. If you grew up with this look, you were either very intrigued with what you're seeing right now or at the very least able to overlook it, but I feel like people without nostalgia for this specific style might be a little turned off. But let's say you're willing to overcome that hurdle. Well, what are you in for? Much like its look, back in 1995 sticks very close to the games that inspired it. You move around with tank controls, combat is handled with the tried and true hold a shoulder button to aim and hit the action button to fire, ammo and healing items are limited, killing every enemy isn't always going to be a good idea, and most of the doors you come across are going to be locked. Truth be told, it's a damn love letter to early survival horror, but sometimes that's to its own detriment. 
combat can be incredibly unwieldy, with the game's only melee weapon taking round about three and a half years to swing. Enemies do have very long, readable wind-ups before attacks, which is good because this game has no run button, so I hope you're good at using tank controls because there's no quick turn or evasive maneuvers here. Like I said, it's clear this thing is aiming for accuracy to that early idea of the genre, but before we get too deep, let's talk about the story, which it turns out is pretty damn easy because there is not much of it, especially at the start. In fact, why don't I go ahead and show you the game's entire opening. That's the tower. Guess I'll make my way there. Yep, pretty straightforward, I would say. Essentially, you've woken up in this odd dystopian wasteland where monsters have taken over and you make up some unknown percentage of a dwindling population. It seems like the survivors in this city have all made their way to the tops of tall buildings, barricading the exits to keep the monsters from getting in, and there's a sort of zip line system linking buildings together. In the center of this city sits a tall tower, and our main character hears a voice calling him towards it, and for most of the game, this is all you're going to get. There are, of course, a few survivors to talk to, but they don't exactly spill any beans on the situation, mostly because they're too busy having you run errands for them. Throughout the playthrough, you'll come across scattered notes detailing some mentally unhinged person, monsters being spotted, and some kind of an accident with a large hadron collider which might be at the center of all this. Of course, you'll come across details revealing what's really going on here, but until you reach the end, it's not likely that they're going to make much sense to you, and I think that's probably the best way to have done this. Don't get me wrong, I love a good deep story, but sometimes all you really need is to plop the player down in a world they don't understand, point them to a spot on the map, and say, you'll know more when you get there. I won't spoil the ending here, but let's just say it perfectly matches the disturbing nature of the game's setup, but in a way you may not expect. Despite the low poly look of the game, it's able to pull off a surprisingly effective atmosphere of dread and isolation. The abandoned office buildings you explore aren't exactly lifelike, but look close enough to the real deal that it's almost eerie. You're only ever going to run into maybe three or four survivors, so you're definitely going to feel alone, and even though the enemies don't look scary even in the least, they have this sort of uncanny effect, and the sheer fact that everyone in this world seems to find them terrifying sort of makes you feel that way as well. Honestly, I was not expecting this game to do this good of a job at disturbing me, and I think a major player in that is the soundtrack. It's mostly long, single-note synth melodies with a sort of barren sound to them, and it really enforces this feeling that something's off around here. I think more than anything, Back in 95 deserves a play just for the atmosphere alone. It's only going to take you maybe a couple of hours to get through at most, and I think it's certainly worth checking out. That being said, there are some real downsides you should probably know about first. Like I said before, this game definitely strives for authenticity, but it often forgoes smart game design in that pursuit. For example, the slow movement speed and lack of a run button is really going to wear on you after a bit. And on that same note, I don't think it was necessary for the melee attack to be this ass. People always seem to complain that combat is clunky in these games, but that always seems to be the ones who aren't very good at playing them. In reality, survival horror combat is a very strict dance of spacing, planning, and mechanical mastery. It's really far deeper than most people know, but here in 95, it almost feels like the game's satirizing that. On top of that, I think text prompts showing up on screen stay there way too long, which means if you're unfamiliar with an area and head to the same locked door a few times, which you will do, you're going to have to stare at a still screen till the text goes away pretty often. And this is going to sound like heresy, but I also didn't like how many steps were taken in the name of chasing after that early PS1 and Sega Saturn look. The texture warping here is definitely close to what you might see in a real game released on the PlayStation, but it is taken to a far extreme. Trust me, even the worst defending PS1 titles did not warp this bad. I also didn't like that there's an ugly, low-res 2D image masking the left and right sides of the screen. Personally, I think it would have been fine to leave those areas blank, but if you are going to put an image there, maybe make it a higher res one. On the plus side, there are these really cool sort of CRT effects baked in here, and I get the feeling the dev intended the game to be played with these on, but even at the lowest preset, they really hurt my eyes after just a few minutes of gameplay. Also, and this is going to be very picky here, but the game displays a tracking artifact on screen when you use the CRT effects, but that wouldn't even be present on a console connected through RF because that's a VHS thing. 
That being said, the 4x3 display and CRT effects are a great idea on paper, I just wish they would have been implemented maybe a little better. The puzzles here are definitely good enough to get your brain working and that's always nice, but I really would have loved to see more mechanically involved ones. As far as I remember, the vast majority that I came across took the form of combination locks with clues to that combination being hidden in the area I was in. Not the worst thing in the world, but a little variety would have been nice. Gameplay areas are also very sectioned off from each other, which is sort of good because there's no in-game map, so you're not going to have to commit large multi-level buildings to memory, but it also means that if you find a key, it 99.99% of the time is going to need to be used within three rooms of where you found it. All that aside though, I enjoyed the hell out of this one. It really gives its all in trying to recreate that early survival horror feel, and in most ways it achieves that goal. It's clearly a very small project, and you can tell it's one that developer really put their heart into. I'd love to see what this guy comes up with, with a little feedback and a far increased budget. Now this is nowhere near a perfect gameplay experience, but it does an amazing job at making you feel like you've been teleported back to the 90s and for the longest time it took a few hours of old Resident Evil games and the House Party movies to have that effect on me. Back in 1995 has been released almost everywhere, so you shouldn't have a hard time getting a hold of it and I recommend you do just that. It's a warts and all type of homage made by someone who not only understands the genre, but seems to also have a lot of reverence for it. And hey, extra authenticity points for cheesy voice acting, right? You want me to wait? That's right. Just sit tight. Nightmare of Decay has been making the rounds on YouTube lately, and I might have never thought to try it out if it weren't for a Twitter follower tagging me in a post that G-Man Lives made about the game, and hot damn am I glad I checked my notifications that day. Anyone familiar with my views on RE7 will know I respect the hell out of that game for bringing the series much closer to its survival horror roots than it's been in years, but I just did not consider it a proper entry in the genre, and a portion of that was thanks to its perspective. And yes, I know that sounds insane, trust me, I've heard the arguments before, but hear me out. Would you call Duke Nukem Time to Kill a first-person shooter? I would assume no, and that's because sometimes when a game's perspective is baked into its overall gameplay design, it can also be responsible for the genre that game fits into. And in my opinion, survival horror sort of requires the perspective of the games that created the genre. I'm crazy like that. Well anyways, I bring this up because if you haven't been watching so far, this is indeed a first person game and I do think it plays a lot like Resident Evil, but hey, even if you disagree with my wacky reasoning utilizing this crazy new concept called objective reality, there is a silver lining. This just happens to be a video talking about games looking to clone Resident Evil and not necessarily the survival horror genre that Resident Evil belongs to and that essentially means we're both off the hook and don't have to argue. I mean, unless you want to. I can't tell you what to do, right? Nightmare of Decay is a first-person Resident Evil clone in the strictest sense of the term. We get an emphasis on conserving resources, item hunting, puzzle solving, backtracking, exploration, the whole shebang. And I'm gonna let you in on a little secret here. It's fucking awesome. I will admit, at first I got a low budget feel from the game's intro, and to be fair, I doubt a whole lot of money went into this project, but don't make my mistake and confuse low budget for low effort. This thing absolutely excels at capturing the spirit of early RE titles in a way that shows me the developers really appreciate a good survival horror romp. The story here is interesting because it sort of doesn't matter. You play some schlub living the bachelor's life when he hears about disappearances plaguing his area and how each victim had been suffering from terrible nightmares and hallucinations. And he just so happens to be having the same issue. So our guy goes to sleep, which obviously you'd want to do immediately after seeing some guy holding a severed head in your living room. I mean, how could you not? Well, anyways, he wakes up in front of a creepy ass mansion and after talking to a cat, an activity I do on a daily basis, he makes his way inside. After this initial event though, I'm gonna go ahead and admit the story may as well not exist and with gameplay this damn satisfying, I'm totally okay with that. But if that is a deal breaker for you, there's a running plot about the mansion itself and the guy who owns it, which does sort of attempt to explain what's going on here. 
That being said though, even if you missed every single one of these journal entries, you're still going to have a blast with this one. Nightmare of Decay does a great job of staying true to the spirit of 90s zombie dodging games, but in a very interesting and novel way. For example, since you have full control over where you aim and shoot, you'd assume combat is much easier than any survival horror game. But there are tiny checks and balances here that keep that from being true. Combat here is still all about spacing and positioning since your walk speed is pretty damn slow and running drains a very small stamina meter when enemies are around. On top of that, you slow to an absolute crawl while reloading, so you're going to want to make sure you keep track of a whole bunch of factors before taking aim at one of these shambling corpses. Attacks can hurt you real bad, and healing items are nowhere near as plentiful as you'd like, at least not on your first run, so you're definitely going to want to be smart about how and when you decide to put a bad guy down. But the combat here, while really fun and deserving of praise, isn't even the shining star in this game in my opinion. If you ask me, all the fun was in navigating the mansion, finding key items and solving puzzles so I could unlock more areas to explore. You know, survival horror stuff. The head scratchers here tend more towards the easier side of things, but they're still fun to figure out and don't screech progress to a halt when they appear, which is always nice. You can really tell what games these guys spent most of their time with back in the day and their passion is made for one hell of a fun RE clone. That being said, as far as tone goes, the horror aspect of survival horror is not a big part of the experience. I mean, okay, maybe there are a few small snippets of things that could be considered scary, maybe, but while I was playing, I more got the feeling that this is an homage to the horror that you used to see in old games from this genre, not necessarily an attempt at scaring the player. A spirit that is most definitely present in the enemy roster. I mean, don't get me wrong, I will always appreciate a game that has you spending most of your time gunning down zombies, but the weird gun-wielding cultist, armor-clad knights, and mimics lets me know that they were just trying to put interesting foes in a game centered around having fun and maybe taking itself seriously did not rank too high on their list of priorities. And speaking of fun, this bad boy is absolutely chocked full of references to other horror media. At one point, I thought I was losing my mind because I could have swore I was fighting Angela from Silent Hill 2, but after coming across a guy who was clearly James Sunderland, I'd say I'm not the crazy one here. There's also this great tension building lead up to a very specific Monty Python joke, a very cheeky callback to re one zombie reveal, and maybe you could argue the cultist or a blood reference. Like I said before, these guys were more interested in having fun than leading you through some dead serious experience, and that makes for one very light, sort of pick up and play kind of atmosphere. I mean, the combat is challenging, and you're definitely going to want to avoid needlessly wasting ammo, so it's not like it's a walk in the park, it just feels really carefree while also being really solidly designed. If I had any complaints at all, it would be that the game isn't very long, but to directly counter that, that's a very typical experience for an RE game, and I did get it for a cool 500 yen, which is a little less than 5 bucks. I also found that my second time around I could breeze through the game relatively effortlessly, but hey, that's kind of the reward you get when you finish a game in this genre, right? For what it is though, Nightmare of Decay is an awesome value. For a measly 5 bucks, you can lock yourself into a good 2 or maybe 3 hours worth of a really great Resident Evil clone, and if you ask me, that is not a very high price to pay for what you get. In my opinion, this dev house is one to keep your eyes on because they clearly understand what makes these games tick, and here's hoping all the attention Nightmare of Decay's been getting inspires these guys to attempt an even more substantial entry in the genre. But hey, even if it doesn't, we still got an amazingly fun few hours out of their efforts, and in a class of games that nearly went extinct, I'd say that's probably a best case scenario. Now here's something I've been meaning to check out for a long time. Dreadout showed up on my radar years ago back when the demo was getting a lot of press and I was pretty intrigued. It was essentially Indonesian Fatal Frame from what I can tell and that sounds like an interesting idea. So I downloaded the demo on Steam, tried it for a minute or two, but then had to leave the house for a bit and never really picked it up again. Years went by and I guess I never really found a reason to pick it back up until now and here's the strange thing. When I went to start it up for this video, it was the full version of the game, which is odd because I'm positive I never purchased this thing. Like I said, I only had the demo and I didn't play enough of it for me to pull the trigger on actually buying it. 
well, whatever the reason, I found that super interesting and it pretty much cemented the fact that I absolutely had to cover Dread Out today. And now that I played a good portion of it, I've got some mixed feelings. Dread Out puts you in the shoes of Linda Melinda, owner of one hell of a funny name and member of some kind of a class trip that is currently going tits up. The teacher in charge seems to have taken a few wrong turns and the group finds themselves at a blocked off bridge which obviously means they should sidestep those barriers and explore what's on the other side. And yes, that ghost pun was very much intended. So our group splits up and finds out this is an entire ass town that seems to have just been up and abandoned. They all decide to meet at a school towards the center of town and when one of them fails to meet back up with the group, all hell breaks loose. All the doors in the school slam shut and Linda's best friend starts to act like she's possessed. Everything fades to black and when Linda wakes up, she's the only one left. So from here on out, the goal is to get the hell out of Dodge and if she can find her friends, that'd be nice too. The themes in the story here very much follow its inspiration Fatal Frame, but everything gets painted with a very Indonesian folklore kind of brush. And maybe you could argue that would lessen the scares a bit, but I didn't find that to be the case at all. In fact, I'd say it only enhanced them. The monsters and cultural practices referenced here were totally foreign to me and not knowing what the hell was going on really helped me feel just as lost and confused as the character I was controlling. I'm sure there were a few aha moments I missed out on by knowing literally nothing about Indonesian superstition, but that's what we like to call in this business an acceptable loss. Well, so far so good, huh? The story is a little spook fest filled with ghosts, abandoned towns, and giant pigs with human faces. All the landmarks of a fun time. Well, not exactly. I'm sure most of you have noticed by now, but Rough Around the Edges doesn't even come close to describing this game. Now, I want to be very clear here. Dread Out as a concept is really damn cool. Not only is Fatal Frame a great source of inspiration, but I love the idea that a small team of 20 developers were able to raise funds for a cool horror game in a market that's like 99.9% .9 mobile titles. It's a success story to be sure, but there are a few things that are very clear from the start. These guys were either very new to game development, were severely underfunded, or some combination of the two because Dread Out is, well like I said, rough around the edges would be a massive understatement. <laughs> Nearly every aspect of the game just screams a lack of know-how and it's not just graphical glitches, although there's plenty of those as well. A lot of ideas here are great on paper, but they just aren't executed very well. For example, the game can be very vague in letting you know where it would like you to go next, and yes, this genre is not about constant hand-holding, but anyone who's played this thing will know what I'm talking about. In the first real section of the school, I picked up several items and had no idea if these were needed to move forward or usable items, and the inventory did not help at all. All I could do was look at them. I couldn't equip them or use them, and trying to select them with a controller's analog stick would move around portions of the on-screen user interface, so that was fun. Sometimes the game would expect me to return to a previous point when there was no indication I should do that and often I would miss important items because the indicator that you can pick something up gets activated when you're right on top of the item and goes away as soon as you're out of range. Also, the game has an interesting system where the screen will have a blue vignette when there's something that can be used or examined nearby and a red one when there's danger, but often the blue effect would happen in spots where there was just flat out nothing to do. No pictures could be taken and there were no items to find. Well, later I would find out that this happens when you're also underneath an item or point of interest, so I'd be walking around on the first floor being made aware of cool stuff to see on the floor above me. Of course, these are all little tweaks that a veteran game designer would know to account for, but someone new to this could understandably miss. And in that same vein, the game's combat, while pretty close to its inspiration, can be a little amateur. Knockback and stun from attacks don't have enough of an effect on enemies, and where you need to aim in order to register as a hit is still unclear to me. Sometimes it's dead center, sometimes it's the head, there's just no consistency. There's also not much of a cooldown in between shots, so there's nothing really stopping you from just mashing the button till the ghost is dead. And of course, there's the expected bad English dialogue, but I feel like if anything, that's more true to the genre, so definitely no complaints there. Alright, so despite all of that, I can't exactly tell you I didn't enjoy my time with Dread Out. It seems like underneath the developmental mistakes and clear budgetary limitations beats the heart of a well-designed survival horror game. There are these big indoor environments with a bunch of rooms that'll need unlocking and more importantly, the atmosphere is just masterfully done. 
early on in the game, I figured out that you can't really die, but instead get transported to this purgatory place until you counterintuitively run into the light. And you'd think not being able to die would have an adverse effect on how scared the game made me, but it was still able to creep me out. This game kept me spooked and enjoying myself despite the absolute mess the gameplay could be. I don't know, it's kind of hard to describe, but I could really feel the heart behind this project. On paper, they failed it a lot here, and I'm not trying to be mean, but objectively, there's more wrong with this game than right, but as you play, you really get the feeling this was a project born out of love and determination. Honestly, I'm not really sure I've ever felt this way about a game before. It was kind of like every time it stumbled, instead of being frustrated, I was just rooting for it to pick itself back up and try again. And while researching this segment of the video, I was genuinely happy to find out that's exactly what they did. Wanna come? Uh, maybe later. Okay, you're lost. Ah, she finally decided to show up. Let's get this vengeance party started! After the relative success of Dread Out, Indonesian dev house Digital Happiness seemed to really get the recognition they deserved. When they made the first game, they had issues securing funding thanks to the Indonesian market being mostly mobile games at the time, but now they're riding relatively high. Hell, they even made a Dread Out movie, and it actually looks really cool. They also produced what is essentially a new campaign for the first game, but what I was most excited to see is that they dropped an honest-to-goodness sequel in 2020, and holy hell does it leave the original in its dust. Dread Out 2 starts out basically where the last one left off. Linda's back in the world of the living, and without giving anything away, let's just say a few of her classmates weren't quite so lucky. Now that she's back, the rest of the kids at school bully the hell out of her, blaming Linda for everything that went down that night. The game starts during a particularly rough incident where a few classmates have locked Linda in a closet, burned her belongings, and taken part in some kind of a ritual that's supposed to curse her, and while I haven't finished the story yet, it seems like it may have worked. Since she was involved in the hell that went down in that abandoned city, she has a bit of a connection to the other side and more importantly, the means to fight it. During one of her typical now trips to the realm of the dead, Linda appears to be possessed and that's where things really start. After this, Linda is constantly harassed by ghosts and old wives tales alike until she goes on the offensive trying to figure out what's in her and how to get it the hell out. And keeping with a the theme you might notice going forward, the story here seems much more solid and well put together. Of course, that's not to say the story in the first game was bad, but for lack of a better word, it was pretty boilerplate. Almost a beat-for-beat -beat reimagining of the first Fatal Frame. Here in the sequel, it seems like things go a lot deeper delving into Linda's past, and the game does a great job of introducing figures that play a larger role in her life. The world of Dread Out 2 is just flat out bigger and includes many more key players than the original. Plus, there's a lot of side content in the story, like this one ghost who used to love street racing when he was alive and all it took to get him to quit running over pedestrians with his souped up ghost bike was to hear him out and let him get some stuff off his chest. Once again, the theme of Indonesian folklore is most of what drives the experience here and as someone who knows less than nothing on the subject, I can confidently tell you you don't need to be in the know in order to get spooked out by it. In fact, like I said before, it might actually help the scares be more effective. On top of that, there's always this feeling that you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg anytime you come across a ghost or hear something offhand in the game's dialogue. I don't know, it's just always cool when things in a video game have meaning, even when you don't necessarily know what that meaning is. As far as gameplay is concerned, you could definitely argue that things are a little different here. I mean, there's a lot of new stuff to do, but that's the key word there, new. You don't lose anything you might have liked from the first game, there's just other stuff to do as well. For example, in Dread Out 1, there was a big town to escape from, and that required going into smaller interior locations and finding your way through them in a way that led you closer to your goal. And that's still the case here, only those smaller locations are now reached via a hub area. And your little hometown, aside from being impressively lively as the game goes on, ends up being a really cool hub where you can talk to locals and get an idea of where you want to go next, which solves one of my issues with the first game. Once you find yourself in a haunted location, which is very often, you'll start to see the little improvements that lead to this sequel feeling like it was made several console generations after the first. Of course, you're still going to be key hunting while using your phone to snap pics of the dead, but they've also thrown in a melee combat component for dealing with demonic enemies and other more tangible threats. And while this system may be pretty basic, it works really well and overall feels like a natural addition to the original game's framework. 
Now here's one hell of a good thing to note. The menu is now an actual asset you can take advantage of instead of the barely functional mess it was before, and while I would still prefer an in-game map to be viewable, I found myself intuiting where I needed to go a lot this time around. Honestly, if I just sat here listing improvements over the first game, we'd be here for hours. It seems like every single element from the original Dread Out was not only brought over, but noticeably improved. Everything from controls to the camera and exploration all just feel like they've been tweaked subtly to feel better and more precise. It's like all of Dreadout's elements just fit together more solidly, and all of these small tweaks make for a game that plays drastically better than the first. I mean, it's almost unbelievable that the same team made both games. When I first booted up Part 2, I had a big smile on my face, sort of like I just watched a friend succeed at something. I was pulling for them so hard in the first game, and it's just awesome to see the guys at Digital Happiness fix the issues in their previous release and improve on that formula this much. Now having said all of that, I don't want to give you the wrong idea. In the context of coming from Dreadout 1 to Part 2, it's like a whole new world in terms of quality, but as a general video game, this is still very much an indie title. You're going to run into small issues all over, and there's still an air of amateur game design about the entire experience. Something made very evident when checking your notepad to see where you need to go next and finding only a single entry labeled Story as the goal. Now personally, I would have preferred something a little more vague like maybe beat the game, but hey, there's always part 3, right? I truly can't tell you guys how happy I am to see this new resurgence of classic survival horror game design, and if you ask me, it's happening in the one and only place it ever could, the indie sector. A place where corporate interference and focus testing flat out don't exist, where experimentation and innovation still hold sway, and in those terms, there is nothing more indie than a single developer being inspired by the horror games of old and releasing a small taste of what they'd like to bring to the modern gaming landscape. Post Trauma is a brand new survival horror game being developed by Roberto Serra, and I'm going to warn you ahead of time, this is not going to take long to cover, as it is a pretty small vertical slice of what he's been up to. But I'll go ahead and say this right now, if this is even a portion of what we can expect from the finished product, I am very excited to see what we end up with. Post Trauma's demo drops you straight into the action as a 57-year-old man who might want to start considering a low-carb diet. Our guy's having a pretty shitty day as he woke up on a train he doesn't remember getting on and to say some strange stuff has gone down in the meantime would be underselling the situation. There's a padlock on one exit and a Lovecraftian nightmare of horrors on the other, so you're basically stuck in this train until you solve a really awesome puzzle that has you looking at several torn up line maps to get values for each train line and adding them together when necessary. Once you're out of the train, you'll head down a tunnel which ends in the absolute worst visual you will ever want to come across in a dark space, and turning back will have you solving a few adventure game type use X item on Y object puzzles and the imagery all along the way is just a masterwork. Your environment feels very Silent Hill in its design, and by that I mean a real-life location that has suddenly been plunged into the depths of hell. Oh, and there's also a save room, and yes, that does mean it includes a soothing save room theme, which is always a plus in these type of games. After solving a really cool puzzle that sees you turning mannequins or actual living beings, I'm not quite sure, you enter into combat with the demo's only tangible enemy and it's… well it works, but let's just say it could be better. After that, you'll have a few items on you that will allow you to progress to the end section where you enter through a doorway that seems promising since it leads to the most amount of light you've seen in this entire demo, but just as you cross that threshold, the whole thing ends. And I've gotta say, I don't think I've ever been quite so intrigued by a demo. This thing really gives you the idea that this guy understands what makes these games work so well. The atmosphere is stellar and you get an awesome feeling of isolation, which is really impressive because I get the feeling there are a lot of placeholder assets being used here, at the very least unfinished ones. 
Starting this bad boy up, you'll be greeted with a warning that this isn't going to be representative of the final product, but goddamn, I hope that's wrong because I'm really excited to see what a finished version of what I just played looks like. Now, I've been very positive so far, and for good reason, but realistically, there is a lot here I don't like, and I'll talk about most of that, but do keep in mind, this is a very rough build of what this developer is working on, so take all of this with a grain of salt. First off, and most annoying, is this overlay that makes the game look like it's being projected onto a tile wall. Now don't get me wrong, I appreciate the symbolism, since all of this does take place in a train station with tiled walls, but it just looks bad in my opinion and covers up what is a really striking look. I'm not real sure why, but I've just never been a fan of these kinds of overlays in horror games, and if this does make it into the final product, it'd be nice to have a toggle on the options menu to get rid of it. So there's a run button, which is always nice, but it uses up stamina a little too fast for my liking and only increases your speed an almost imperceptible amount over the normal walk speed. Although I did find that you could move just as fast and not use stamina by just mashing the run button real fast like in GTA, a practical solution on paper, but it makes you look like this while moving, so maybe it doesn't work quite so well. In a finished version, it'd be nice to see a change here, like maybe keeping the system where attacks cost stamina, but just let the player run all they want. Some 3D models might look a little cheesy, and there may be a few spelling errors to iron out, but I can firmly say the enemy design and overall look to the monsters needs no tweaking. You get a sort of mix of Silent Hill's body horror approach, but with more of a demonic feel, and the result is really awesome. Now this is a big one. The controls can be very awkward, especially in the one and only fight in the demo, but I do think there's an easy fix for that. Maybe keep the analog driven 3D control scheme for newbies, but add a proper tank control method for people with, let's say, refined palettes. To balance that complaint though, I will say the camera here is sheer perfection. It follows the player around but on fixed paths which is an awesome compromise between the stationary pre-rendered look and a more dynamic camera system. This way the developer gets the absolute control over how every scene can be viewed that you get with a survival horror game but the player doesn't have to navigate that game via a series of still screens. A nice compromise I'd say. Like I briefly touched on before, the puzzles here work really well. I'd say they strike a nice balance between being hard enough that I didn't breeze through them, but solvable enough that I didn't have to sit for 20 minutes trying to figure them out or look up some kind of an online guide. Now sure, that might not be the same case for everyone, but if this demo is any indication, I think the puzzles in the finished game are going to be really awesome. And honestly, I could talk way longer about this thing, but likely I've already shown you all of my captured footage three times over by now, so I'm going to go ahead and end the preview here. This being such an early look at work in progress, obviously it's going to be rough around the edges, but I am fully confident this guy is capable of delivering an incredible modern survival horror experience, which is something I think we can all agree is sorely needed right now. Out of all the games we've covered so far, I would say this one is particularly important. Tormented Souls showed up on my radar thanks to a buttload of people suggesting it to me, and like I said in the intro, I was not what you would call confident in the concept of modern survival horror. But I didn't exactly have anything better to do, so I bought myself a copy and tried it out, and I wasn't a full 20 minutes into the game before I figured out I was in love. There were tank controls, a fixed perspective, puzzles, backtracking laden exploration, item hunting, and a heavy emphasis on resource conservation. It honestly felt like this game was made specifically for me. More importantly though, it was this exact game that inspired me to dive into a genre I was all but sure was dead, leading to the creation of this video. Now I already covered this little gem on my channel a while back, so I'm going to try not to spend too much time reiterating myself here, but let me give you the basics. You play as Caroline, a girl going about her everyday life when she gets a letter in the mail from a Canadian hospital containing a picture of some twins and an ominous message. Having nothing much else on her plate at the moment, she decides to check the place out in hopes of figuring out why she gets this sharp pain and odd feeling every time she looks at the picture. And right about here is where a lesser YouTuber would reach for some low-hanging fruit, like maybe making a joke about the real horror in this game coming from the fact that you spend all your time dealing with the Canadian healthcare system. 
No, not me though. What I choose to do is make a joke about how someone else would make that joke, so it's in your head already and I may as well have made it. It's genius. Anyways, Caroline shows up to the hospital and isn't there more than a few minutes till she gets molly whopped upside the head knocking her out. She wakes up sometime later not only naked but sans one eye, which you gotta figure is a really rough way to wake up. The rest of the game is spent unraveling the mystery of this hospital, the things that went down here, and who the hell up and stole her damn eyeball. I won't say much more than that here, but if you're looking to dig a little deeper, I'll have a link in the corner and in the description leading you to my full video on TS. As far as gameplay is concerned, things are just like I said before. This is flat out exactly what survival horror heads are going to want from a new game. It sticks insanely close to the tenets of the genre, even when that means using what some people might consider outdated mechanics. Speaking of which, you control Caroline with tank controls, and everything from her movement speed to her animations make that process an absolute dream. If you want, you can use the analog stick for a more quote-unquote modern style of control, but trust me, you're going to want to go with the D-pad here. It just matches the aesthetic and the overall atmosphere of the game perfectly. Combat's handled just like you'd expect, with you holding a shoulder button while hitting the action button to shoot, and it works exactly as well as it used to back in the PS1 era. And here's a fun little tip. I found a method that really helped conserve ammo by downing an enemy with a few shots from the starting pistol equivalent, which is a nail gun. Awesome. Anyways, then you head into your inventory screen, switch to a melee weapon, and get a few hits in while they're on the ground. It's a little annoying, I'll admit, but it's not like it's a necessary strategy or anything. Just something to help crazy people like myself. You know, the kind that feel actual, real-world guilt when they use too much ammo in one of these games. Father, what's going on here? Why is that weird man walking around the operating table with that weird chandelier in his hands? What are you talking about, child? I don't see anything. Progression is very Resident Evil-esque, with you always on the lookout for new keys or items that might be used to solve some kind of a puzzle. Each new door leads to a new unexplored area of the hospital and subsequently more doors that need to be unlocked. It's all just perfectly survival horror, and for those of you paradoxically watching this video but not too sure what that means, I think I said it best in my video covering TS last year. Which is the real draw here, and really for all games in this genre. In a title like this, it's not so much about being mechanically skilled at the game, that is to say pushing the right buttons at exactly the right time, but instead it's about planning and execution. It's not about following a waypoint on your map to an enemy encounter and then having your skills be the only determining factor for whether or not you proceed. It's more about finding a porcelain hand and remembering, oh yeah, that's right, there's a door in that hallway that requires a knocker. And at that point, the next 10 minutes of the game is basically played inside your mind. You gotta ask yourself questions like, what items do I have with me? Are there any enemies on my route? And if I do get jumped, would I rather spend resources to heal myself after a risky dodge or on ammo used to engage in combat? Like I've said before, this genre as a whole is based on puzzle solving, and just getting from point A to point B can certainly be approached the same way you would any other puzzle. And if you ask me, this style of exploration is the element Tormented Souls nails best. Well said, past Jared. Anyways, hopefully that clears things up. Tormented Souls is a knockout punch for people like me who've been dying for this genre to come back. It does everything a fan of survival horror would want, and all with a level of polish you just cannot deny given the circumstances. I mean, just look at these backgrounds. An indie dev made these. That's crazy. I'm just gonna come out and say it. This is exactly how the RE2 and 3 remakes should have looked and played, and this game proves that it would have worked. This game is an absolute blast for old fogies like me that lived through the 90s, but hopefully it's shown a lot of you guys the light and started you down a path of seeking out more titles like this. If not, I don't know, maybe let's hope this video might. Alright, cards on the table. I usually like to end these little segments with something witty, but really and truly, Tormented Souls is just the highest recommendation I could give. No fluff, no flowery language, this is just flat out a game that needs to be played if you're watching this, so stop what you're doing and figure out a way to play it ASAP. Them and Us is an interesting little modern survival horror game that viewers of the channel have been asking me about for a while, and so I figured I'd download the demo and see what all the fuss was about. And I can't really say why, but for whatever reason it just did not rub me the right way back then. 
I'm not really sure if its developer, Tendo Games, made any updates to the way it looks and feels, or if I was just in a bad mood that day, but I came away from this game with a pretty bad taste in my mouth. So I'll admit, when it came time to give it another shot for this video, I wasn't exactly excited, but I'll be damned if it didn't win me over almost immediately. These guys clearly know their stuff where survival horror is concerned because Them and Us plays like one of the greats. It focuses on exploration through item hunting and puzzle solving, puts an emphasis on tough combat seen through the lens of a classic survival horror framework, and as a cool little bonus, quick turning is activated the same way it is in RE, so that's muscle memory that won't go to waste. And as a fun little surprise, right here at the intro screen, I've already got something cool to talk about. Them and Us lets you choose between an RE4-like over-the-shoulder third-person camera and a more RE1-inspired fixed camera system, and, well, I don't think I need to inform anyone which one I ended up going with. This demo starts out with an initial story dump that sees us in the shoes of Alicia Walker, a woman who's been in some kind of mental hospital for nearly a decade. She makes it seem like it's the doctors and med cocktails that's ripping her sanity away, but to be fair, I'd wager most people in a psych ward would say the same thing. Apparently, she used to be a medic of some kind and lost her daughter to some ailment. She struggles with not being able to heal the one person that means the most to her, but says she's on the road to discovering just what went down with her daughter, so I guess there's some kind of mystery to be solved within what seems to be a pretty open and shut case. My own fate has placed me squarely on the path to finding her. Now, we may not know what she's actually in for, but we do know that she's up for a prison transfer, which in video game terms means she's guaranteed to be the lone survivor of a bus crash. Now, this next cutscene, while really cool, is in a pretty weird spot for me. On one hand, it's in a totally different art style than what we were just looking at, so that's kind of off-putting, but on top of that, it's also interlaced, so we get to look at some sweet combing artifacts while we're watching it. Alright, dumb stuff aside, our girl wakes up to a skirmish that already seems to be at its apex and I get proven to be clairvoyant once again. Alicia limps around trying to get away but passes out from her injuries not too far away from the site of the crash. While being transported by boat by someone we don't know to somewhere we can't see, Alicia goes in and out of consciousness and then she wakes up in a strange bed located within an even stranger mansion. And I swear I won't do this again, but just so you guys don't also spend way too long in this room, your knife can both be used and equipped. We'll just leave it at that. After figuring that out, we're given a low effort but much appreciated tutorial screen and then we're free to explore this creepy ass mansion. And it won't take more than a few minutes of gameplay before you figure out that you are playing a genuine real deal survival horror title. We've got tank controls, inventory management, item and environmental based puzzles, loads of exploration requiring an even greater amount of backtracking and of course an absolute infinite amount of locked doors. As I was taking my first steps in the game, I just found myself nodding my head in agreement, like they were checking off items in my own personal survival horror checklist. Which really shows that the dev team not only used classic entries in the genre as inspiration, but also understood enough about those games to really get the little elements that need to come together in order for a new title to give off that same authentic feel. I mean, even when I had an initial complaint, it ended up getting remedied almost immediately. See, I was ready to start complaining about how annoying it was that I only had two spare inventory slots, but a few rooms down from my starting location I found a backpack that brought that number up to the standard six. But while I was struggling with those two initial inventory slots, I found an element I never thought I'd see in one of these games again. These guys took the ability to drop items right where you stand and recollect them whenever you want from RE0 and that immediately put a smile on my face. Not only is that a game that I've always thought was criminally underrated, but that system specifically always struck me as a natural evolution of the classic RE framework. And speaking of RE, we not only have a callback to the first zombie reveal, but also the one in the bathroom from Remake which never gets enough love. And since we're on the subject, zombies are the only enemies you'll come across in this demo and I'd say they act exactly like you'd expect from the genre. It takes a little while till you get your hands on your first firearm, so you're either going to have to get good at knifing or dodging, and by the way, I know I said I wouldn't do this again, but another slight hint. This display case right here can be moved if you examine it from behind and only from behind. I'm not going to ruin the rest of the puzzle, but trust me, that's going to save you at least a few minutes of fruitless searching. I, um, 
may or may not have figured this out right at the end of the demo and never got a chance to fire this thing once. Missed opportunities aside though, I really enjoyed how faithful Them and Us is to the tenets of survival horror. It's really refreshing to see even in the context of a list of other games that's also doing that. You've probably noticed I've been showering this game with praise so far, and to be fair, I do mean every word, but I put all the compliments up front to soften the blow because I've got a lot of complaints as well. And honestly, if you've had your eyes open up to this point, you've probably noticed most of them. This is an indie project created in Unreal 3, and while Tendo Games have made a title as true to the genre as their name is hard to Google, it's still incredibly rough around the edges. The main character will turn her head to look at objects of interest in the environment, which is awesome, but I think this could have used a little more tweaking because she does it for points of interest that are pretty far away, and when there's a few in a room together, the poor girl nearly breaks her own neck to look at them all. While the models for zombies look really good at a distance, and even when you're shining your flashlight directly at them, they have very basic animations that start and stop in a pretty jerky way. Although I will say the way they ragdoll on death actually looks really cool. The inventory screen, while looking very true to the genre, does seem like it's lacking a little visual flair. I mean, it's perfectly laid out, but it could have used a little more personality, I think. Throughout the game, you'll come across truly impressive lighting that'll have you thinking a much larger team worked on it, but then you'll also see bloom and god rays that are far too overpowering, and it'll remind you, yeah, it's an indie game. The camera system is akin to the kind of stuff we saw in the latter days of the genre, with it remaining locked in perspective but tracking the player on a fixed course. So when you're exploring the environment, you get these really great looking sweeping shots that really sell the old school aesthetic while still improving on it. Like I said before, this is probably the best compromise we could have between old school survival horror fans and people who want to control their cameras. A little bit of both camps, if you will. Anyways, getting to the actual problem, sometimes the camera movement can present a bit of judder, kind of like the game's dropping frames. Now it's not always present, but when it shows up, it's really annoying. And before you ask, without bragging, trust me my specs are more than up to par with what this game might be demanding. On the plus side though, these environments look absolutely pristine. I mean, just truly impressive. But with all that fidelity, we run into a similar problem that Tormented Souls faced, where the backgrounds look so damn good it draws attention to the more amateur looking main character. And lastly, for a game that, like I said, is really impressive but very rough around the edges, I think a price tag of 40 bucks does sort of sting. Now don't get me wrong, if the game continues to deliver on its initial survival horror goodness, I am more than willing to cough up a little extra scratch, but for a dev house that only has one title to its name, I think a lower price point would likely lead to more success. But that being said, Them and Us definitely intrigued me, so I ponied up the 40 Wing Wangs and added it to the old library. This thing most definitely has an insanely promising start, and I'm really interested to see if it can keep that pace up. Maybe be on the lookout for a video in the future showcasing my findings, but until then there's no reason you shouldn't head to Steam right now and download the free demo. This thing gets a whole lot right and stays staggeringly true to a dead genre, which I think is more than deserving of a test drive. Well, every video like this needs its wild card, something that bucks a trend or defies expectation, and I'd say Evil Tonight most definitely fits that mold. Now, I'm sure some of you are probably getting ready to leave a comment on this video calling me a hypocrite. After all, I often say that visual elements are a part of the survival horror genre, and well, this is about as visually far from Resident Evil as you could possibly get. And sure, maybe there's some truth there, but A, a top-down perspective that isn't directly controlled by the player sits a little closer to a fixed camera system than you might think. I mean, games like Code Veronica and Dino Crisis use a similar moving camera that also follows the player, and I'd say those two stay true to their roots. But more importantly, B, you're just gonna have to trust me on this one. This game stays faithful to the genre in almost every single other way despite it looking more like Seiken Densetsu than Biohazard. But before we go down that road, let's talk about story, which is definitely something a little outside of survival horror's typical realm. The game starts by introducing us to our characters who don't have much time to shine here but still end up coming off as likable and kind of funny. 
You play as Sylvia, an exorcist who's obsessed with the concept of all men in the world wanting to date her, which is essentially both members of Dirty Pair put together. And right off the bat, the story has a very cool en medias res kind of thing going on, with its events setting up a flashback, and that flashback is what you end up playing through. Sylvia was apparently hired to cleanse an evil presence from a performing arts school, and how she goes about doing that is transporting the whole place into a kind of spirit realm where these things can manifest themselves into reality. In the process of exploring the place, Sylvia comes across a group of kids who just so happen to be in the area during her ritual and as a result got sucked into this weird ghost realm with her. So on top of finding the vengeful ghost that haunts the school and convincing her to move on, she's got to reunite this friend group and keep them from getting killed. Even though you have these other characters to talk to throughout the story, most of your interactions are going to be Sylvia talking to Sylvia. And the good news is, she's an interesting character. The writing really does a great job of keeping her funny and endearing. As you progress through the main story, you come across diary entries from the girl who died and now haunts the place, and it becomes this nice little side content. It's delved out in your typical RE method, that being files you find as you explore, and it's a nice little tale that starts off with a bit of mystery. So the story here is definitely up to snuff in my opinion and sets itself apart from most survival horror games by being funny on purpose and not through some poorly written dialogue. However, a game in this genre can't stand up on narrative alone and that means I get to talk about the most interesting part of this little sprite based experience. <laughs> And just so you know, I've been racking my brain trying to think of all the little bits of Evil Tonight that makes it feel so true to survival horror, but I think the point lies therein. It just feels like an entry in the genre. I mean, sure, there are definitely tangible elements I can point to, and believe me, I will, but I think in getting all analytical with video games here on this channel, I might be missing out on some of the more important aspects of the medium. You know, maybe sometimes it's not all about what you can prove to an audience, and more about what you felt while playing a game, and while playing what is essentially a SNES-era action RPG, I felt the heart of a survival horror game beating within it. Evil Tonight has you exploring a big spooky location that starts out very tight and localized, until enough item collecting, puzzle solving, and backtracking opens up more areas to explore and thus more backtracking, puzzle solving, and item hunting. You guys know the deal. It's an experience I'm sure most of you have had before, but it's hiding under the veneer of a top-down 2D game, which is really interesting. And man, I really need to express how accurately these guys hit the mark with this thing. The puzzles feel challenging as hell, but it's the kind of challenge that has you getting a little frustrated and then looking around in desperation, only to find that the hint you needed was right there in the environment the whole time aka exactly what this genre is known for. As usual, most doors in the place are locked, and like you'd expect, finally finding a key to that one door in the starting area you've been wondering about the entire game is insanely satisfying. In an odd choice, I started out hating but ended up really appreciating, Evil Tonight includes no in-game map. And believe me, this is no small environment. It can be very easy to get lost here, but as you explore, you get more and more familiar with the place, and eventually I was navigating with ease. And I'm dead serious about that. That really started out as a major complaint of mine for the first hour of the game, but as I played more, it became more and more of a compliment. On the plus side, instead of having you examine every single door in the school and having you wait through an infinite amount of dialogue boxes, coming near a door will pop up an icon of the key you need to open it something I think more games in the genre could definitely use. Now I'm sure by this point you guys are wondering about combat, and oddly enough it works eerily similar to any other game in the genre. Holding a trigger will ready your weapon, and hitting the action button fires it. Pretty simple. You can also press the run button while aiming for a quick melee attack, and I found most of my time was spent knifing enemies to death using ammo sparingly, a tactic I am more than a little familiar with. And sure, maybe I could have gotten through most encounters way easier and way faster if I would have used my guns more, but there is at least a small portion of the crowd who will 100% understand why I couldn't live with myself if I did that. Which further fuels why I think this game sticks so close to the genre, even when it looks so radically different. But speaking of looks, have you guys seen how damn good this sprite art is? I mean, for real, this thing looks mouthwateringly good. 
Every single asset in Evil Tonight is just gorgeous, and on top of the raw pixel artistry, there are these cool lighting and fog effects layered over top. The environment is just beautifully crafted, and while it is sort of hard to be spooked out by a faux 16-bit look, I think this game is probably as close as any 2D game will get to being scary. The style of monsters and characters alike is definitely aligned more on the anime side of the spectrum, but come on, super deformed anime proportions and pixel art just go hand in hand. I really couldn't imagine it looking any different. All the items in the game have great looking sprites drawn up for them, but if you ask me, the animations are the real star of the show here. Everything from idle stances to attacks have a very fluid feel to them, and that really adds to how satisfying the gameplay is. And I am very happy to say the music is also spot on for the genre. Really and truly, this whole thing is just an amazing package. I cannot recommend it enough. Evil Tonight is an amazing tribute to all the tenets of classic survival horror and stays more true to the Resident Evil side of things than its visuals would have you believe. Basically what I'm saying is, avoid this game if you're into not having fun and being lame. For the rest of you, get out there and drop a few bucks on one of the best games I've played in a good long while. Well guys, I hope you got a kick out of me writing a historical wrong here. If you've got any hot tips on modern survival horror titles I haven't checked out yet, feel free to share them because I'm really having fun with this idea. I think I may have enough collected for a second volume, but hey, the more the merrier. And speaking of that, I do have to get back to work slaving over an expensive computer I've apparently built just to play indie games made in Unity. It was nice hanging out with you guys for a bit though, and until I see you all again, as usual, I'm Jared. And this is Avalanche Reviews. Well, howdy partners. I appreciate you guys making it to the end of this thing, and I meant what I said before. Any and all recommendations are welcome. If you think it fits the genre and was made relatively recently, slap some knowledge upside my head. While you're at it, maybe check out my Patreon page where you can support more projects like this, and if it's not too much to ask, a like and subscribe would be nice too. Well, here's hoping I see all of you again in the next one, but until then, be excellent to each other, and some other Keanu Reeves quotes.